Chapter 9 By 11 o'clock that night, I was out of things to do. I'd pretty well done everything. I'd trimmed my nails, taken a bath, cleaned my ears, even watched the news on TV. Did push-ups, sit-ups, stretched, ate dinner, finished my book, but I wasn't sleepy. I thought about checking out the stuff elevator one more time, but it was too early for that. I had to wait until after midnight for the comings and goings of employees to fall off. In the end, I decided to go up to the lounge on the 26th floor. I nursed a martini while gazing out blankly at the flecks of white swirling down through the void. I thought about the ancient Egyptians, tried to imagine what kind of lives they led. Who were the ones that joined the swim club? No doubt it was the pharaoh's clan, aristocrats, upper classes, trendy, jet-set ancient Egyptians. They probably had their own private section of the Nile or built special pools to teach their chick strokes in. Complete with handsome, likable swim instructor, like my friend the movie star, who'd say things like, Excellent, your highness. Only perhaps thou might extend thy right arm a little further for the crawl. The sky blue waters of the Nile, the scintillating sun, thatched cabanas and palm fawns a must, spear bearing shoulders to beat back the crocodiles and commoners, swaying reeds the pharaoh's crowd. Princes, sure, but what about princesses? Did women learn to swim? Cleopatra, for instance, in her younger days looking like Jody Foster, would she have swooned over my classmate, the swim instructor? Most likely, that's what he was there for. Somebody ought to make a film like that. I, for one, would pay to see it. No, the swim instructor couldn't be of poor birth. He'd be the son of the king of Israel or Assyria or somewhere like that, captured in battle and dragged back to Egypt, a slave. But he doesn't lose an iota of his good-naturedness, even if he is a slave. That's where he differs from Charlton Heston or Kirk Douglas. He flashes his brilliant white teeth in a smile and takes a lick, aristocratically. Then, standing on the banks of the Nile, he takes out a ukulele and bursts into a chorus of Rockahula baby. Obviously, he's the only man for the part. Then, one day, the pharaoh and entourage happen by. The swim instructor's out scything reeds when he sees a bar's capsize. Without the least hesitation, he dives into the river, swims a magnificent crawl out, and rescues a little girl and races the crocodiles back to shore, all with powerful grace, all gracefully as he had lit the Bunsen burner in the science class. The pharaoh is most impressed and thinks, that's it, I'll get this youth to teach my princess how to swim. The previous swim instructor had proven insubordinate and was thrown into the bottomless pit just the week before. Thus my classmate becomes the royal swim instructor, and he's so likable everyone adores him. At night, the ladies in waiting anoint their bodies with oils and perfumes and hasten to his bed. The princes and princesses are all devoted to him. Caught to a spectacle scene on the order of the bathing beauty or the king and I, my classmate and the princess and princesses in a grand synchronized swim routine in celebration of the pharaoh's birthday, the pharaoh is overjoyed, which further boosts the youth's stock. Still, he doesn't let it go to his head. He is a paragon of humility. He smiles the same as ever and pieces elegantly. When a lady in waiting slips under the covers with him, he spends a full one hour on foreplay, brings her all the way to climax, then afterward strokes her hair and says, you're the best. He's a good guy. For a moment, I try to picture sleeping with an Egyptian court lady. But the image wouldn't gel. The more I forced it, the more everything turned into 20th century Fox's Cleopatra. Very epic. Elizabeth Taylor, Richard Burton, Rex Harrison, the Hollywood exotic mode. Olive skinned, long-legged slave girls waving long-handled fans over Liz, who strikes various glamorous poses to seduce my classmate, a specialty of the Egyptian femme fatale. But the Jodie Foster Cleopatra has fallen head over heels for him. Mediocre fare, admittedly, but that's the movies. He's pretty much gone on Jodie Cleopatra too. But he's not the only one who's crazy about Jodie Cleopatra. There's a dark, dark Arabian prince who's burning with passion for her. He's so in love with her that just thinking about her is enough to make him dance. The role is tailor-made for Michael Jackson. He's crossed the Arabian sands all the way to Egypt for her love. 
We see him dancing around the caravan campfire, shaking a tambourine, singing Billy Jean. His eyes gleam in the starlight. So of course, there ensues a major face-off between Michael and my classmate, our swim instructor, a rivalry between lovers. I'd gotten this far when the bartender came over and said sorry. Closing time. It was a quarter past 12. I was the last customer in the lounge. Glasses were already drying on towels. The bartender almost threw cleaning up. Had I been tweaking this nonsense all the time? What an idiot. I signed the bill, down the last of my martini and walked out, shuffling my way to the elevators, hands useless in my pockets. Still, wasn't Jodi Cleopatra obliged to marry her younger brother? My dream scenario had a life of its own. I couldn't get it out of my head. The scenes kept on coming. Her shiftless and crooked younger brother now would be good for the part. Woody alien? Give me a break. This isn't a comedy. We don't need a court jester cracking stupid jokes, hitting himself over the head with a plastic mallet. We'll work on the brother later. The fairies got to go to Laurence Olivier. Always got a migraine, always pressing fingers to his temples, throws anyone who gets on his nerves into the bottomless pit or makes them swim the Nile with the crocs. Intelligent, cruel and high strung. Digs out people's eyes and throws the poor souls into the desert. Oh, the casting. The casting and the elevator arrived. The door opened ever so silently. I got in and pressed 15 and went back to my Egyptian movie. Not that I really wanted to, but there was no way to stop it. The scene changes to the desert wastelands. Unbeknownst to all, in a cave in the wilderness lives a solitary prophet recluse cast out of society by the pharaoh. With his eyes gouged out, he has miraculously survived his long trek across the desert. A sheepskin shields him from the merciless sun. He dwells in total darkness, eating locusts and wild grasses. He gains inner vision and sees the future. He sees the fall of the pharaoh, Egypt's twilight, a world shifting on its foundations. It's the shipman, I think. The shipman? The elevator door opened silently and I exited without thought. The shipman? In ancient Egypt? Isn't this all meaningless pastiche anyway? I reasoned these things out, standing hands in my pockets in total darkness. Total darkness? Only then did I notice the complete absence of light. Not one speck of light. As the elevator door shut behind me, I was enveloped in a lacquer black darkness. I couldn't see my own hands. The muzak was gone too. No love is blue, no a summer place, and the air was chill and moldy. I stood there alone, abandoned in utter nothingness.